Welcome back to part 5 of Password Cracking 101 plus 1. Okay, so in the last video we finished a brute force attack where we looked at attacking an MD5 hash and uh, telling Hashcat to try every possible uh, character of our principal 95 characters until you find the right password. And it did that by building up uh, using increment and we eventually found it was a 5 character password. Okay, we're going to move on from there now into mask attacks. So mask attacks are a subset of brute forcing um, and mask attacks are really really good when there's something we know about the password. So anything we know about the password we can use to reduce the key space and as we found in the last uh, last video uh, the key space can be very very big indeed. So anything we can do to reduce the number of guesses and still guarantee a password crack would be fantastic. Assuming of course we have the resources and time available to us. So for example, if we know the password only contains mixed alphanumerics, or if we know it starts with a capital letter, or we know it ends with one, for example, the number one, these are things we can do and help uh, increase our chances of, of successfully guessing a password. doesn't always work, of course, uh, but it can help a great deal. If we look at the inbuilt character sets to Hashcat, Again, before in brute forcing, we, we looked at the A placeholder, which covers our bases for lower, upper, decimal, and special. But individually, we do, of course, have these character sets in their own right. And it's these character sets that we, we use in a mask attack. So it's a very similar way that we do a mask attack than it is to brute force. And in fact, we use the same attack mode, attack mode 3. So when we're conducting a mask attack, there's no separate mode for it, because we are still technically uh, brute forcing, but we're only brute forcing specific uh, character sets as opposed to the entire 95 principal character uh, ASCII set. Okay, you can see here in this very simple example that we have a password of pwned123 exclamation mark and we can see a mask that might apply to that. Started with an upper and then we have lowercase characters, three digits and a special at the end. Now of course we wouldn't know that necessarily, but it just shows you how a mask might be applied to a password. If we want to test for more than one character set in a specific place, we can also tell Hashcat to use custom character sets or positional character sets, which we can assign with dash one, two, three, and four, generally. So um, in this lower example here, let's say, for example, we know that the password starts with the clear text string of p at sswrd, and then it's followed by three either upper or lower alpha characters, but we don't know, okay? Now, if we knew it was an explicit character set, we could assign that with L, U, D, or S, and that would be fine. But if we don't know, but we know it's not A, so we know it's not everything, but it could be a lower, it could be an upper, or it could be a number or a special, but you're not sure, we can reduce the key space by excluding character sets we know we don't need to test. And this is where it really helps us, because of course, if we're testing less, it's gonna take less time, and it's gonna increase our chance of success. So in this instance, we're going to create two character sets, in this example I should say. Character set number one is going to contain just upper and lower alpha characters only. Character set number two is going to contain just decimal and special characters only. And then when we apply our mask, we're going to say we're going to have three characters, and these three characters can only be upper or lower, and the last character here, denoted by question mark two, can only be decimal or special. So you can create your own character sets to be what you will and assign them positionally as you wish, depending, of course, on which elements of the password that you might know. Okay, And this will, do, uh, this will really, really help you reduce the key space. Hashcat does not have to test as much, and therefore you'll get a lower ETA. Whether it's, of course, exhaustible and crackable or not remains to be seen. But doing this is certainly better than doing question mark A's, for example. If you know something about the password, do what you can to reduce the key space. Okay, so mask attacks. Hashcat also comes with some default mask files, which are found in the masks folder within Hashcat by default. You'll see some like this. Uh, we're not going to go into them all. Needless to say that some of these have been generated using, for example, the RockU dictionary. So this first one is after 60 seconds of runtime on the RockU dictionary. This one after 1800 seconds, and it builds up uh, and up and up and up, up to a day and beyond, actually. And these mask files have been designed with common masks that have been found based on patterns found in the RockU dictionary. Again, 
there's nothing to say necessarily they'll complete or not based on the types of attacks you're conducting but they're very good um, masks that have been identified based on analysis on the Rock U dictionary so you might want to look at some of these default mask files you can of course create your own as well and if you look inside some of these you can see look we have a number two numbers a lowercase letter four numbers and these are all things that have been shown to be common masks based on statistics and analysis done with the Rock U dictionary in this instant so you know good things to test um, uh, test your uh, attacks with and to see what you get and of course you can of course create your own mask files as well which again I encourage you to sort of play around with and test okay so we've looked at uh, Linux hashes and Windows hashes so far we're gonna stick on the Windows trade and go on to cache domain credentials which is another password type found on Windows operating systems now, cache domain creds are the only truly uh, salted hash in Windows, uh, but the salt is the username, uh, which unfortunately makes it uh, not as great as Linux, for example, that uses random unique salts. Um, but so, you know, salting is better than not salting, but unfortunately, no, it's not, not the best salt in the world, the username. And needless to say, that's what we're dealing with here with cache domain credentials. Now, what do cache domain creds do? They allow us to uh, roam. They allow us to go on business trips. They allow us to do all, uh, do all the, the work we want to do when when not connected to our domain, um, you know, uninterrupted, shall we say. So um, I appreciate, you know, people uh, are all connected now and we all do a lot of we all do a lot of work on our phones and other things. But if you just if you just take the example of you've got your your work laptop, uh, you're usually sitting in the office. You know, if you have an office that you go to, you're connected to your work domain. You take your laptop home with you and you're working at home or you're going on a business trip or you're checking at a hotel, whatever it might be. You're able to, generally speaking, power up your laptop, log on with your domain username and password, even though you're not connected to your organization's domain. This is what cache domain credentials allow you to do. And, and until you need to access something that requires network validation, until you need to connect to a domain resource, you can use your desktop, you can save files, you can work effectively offline, so to speak, and it's absolutely fine. Okay, This is what cache domain creds are. They're stored in the security registry hive in a subkey called cache, um, and by default, the last 10 unique logons are stored, except for Windows 2008. I have no idea why. Um, I have looked into this. I'm not sure. I believe actually Windows 2008 has a default value of 25, and I have no idea why that is. Uh, but this is um, a value that you can modify in the registry between uh, between 0 and 50, but by default in a domain environment, the last 10 unique logons are saved. And a cache domain credential is a double computed NTLM hash. So if you think back to um, an earlier video where we looked at how NTLMs were constructed, we've got our NTLM here, we're prepending that with the username, which in this case is the salt, and then we are NTLMing the whole thing again. So definitely a lot slower to kind of crunch the numbers than a raw NTLM would be, um, but certainly not as slow as other things like Bcrypt, for example. Okay, on to the next exercise then, mask attacks. So, as you might have guessed by talking about cached credentials, we are going to look at a cached domain credential in the next exercise. Now, because this is a mask attack, we're going to give you some give you something to work with, something that you can help hopefully do to reduce the key space of your uh, attack. This password is seven characters long. It starts with a special character and is followed by the literal characters $UNM, as shown here, case sensitive, of course. The last two characters are either lower alpha or numeric. Okay, so based on what we've just covered, we're going to want to create a custom character set to make sure we're only guessing for lower alpha and numeric characters here and we have a clear text string that we can also pass to hashcat on the command line to crack our password so let me bring Callie back into view if we look in our exercises folder oh a little bit too far there typos are in full force today okay exercise 5 cached hash and here we go so we have a cached domain credential here let me grab the attack and paste it in here and let's just talk through it so mode 2100 I'm gonna skip looking through the help to identify the mode here in this instance but cache domain credentials are mode 2100 and that's what we're interested in here we've pasted our hash to standard in so we've had to quote it because we have special characters here that will break things otherwise 
we are calling attack mode 3, which is brute force mode. As I mentioned earlier, even when doing these attacks, we are still uh, working under the brute force mode in Hashcat. And then we've got a custom character set that we are defining here with dash 1. So dash 1 is going to be L and D. And the reason we're, of course, doing that is because we know the last two characters are either lower alpha or numeric. So we want to tell Hashcat only to test for lower alpha and decimals when it sees a question mark one inside our mask. Okay? It's also seven characters long and we know we've got a fixed string. So here's our password. We're quoting this again because of the, the special characters on the command line here. But we start with a special character as defined here. So question mark S, no need to test anything else in that position. It's then followed by the clear text characters $UNM, case sensitive as shown there. And the last two characters are either lower alpha or lower alpha or numeric. So this is where we call on our mask question mark one for the last two characters here. And in these positions, Hashcat's only going to test lower and decimal. Okay? So let's start that. And hopefully this won't take too long. We can see it's running here. Hashcat's of course identified this now as a cache domain credential. It's showing us our hash here. It's of course giving us our usual ETA, how long it thinks it's gonna how long it thinks it's gonna take. We've got our mask here, which is showing us our clear text mark um, clear text characters in the middle. And we can now see in this example we have a defined character set, just our lower and decimal shown number one. We're only guessing at a, a meager little over two thousand guesses a second here, so very, very poor indeed. Uh, and you can see here, it took uh, took 12 seconds, so not very long at all. It's cracked the password, and here is our clear text string, okay? And if we look at that um, here, we can see this does, of course, conform to what we were looking for. It is a seven-character password. It starts with a special. It's got our clear text string, and it ends in either number um, or lower, lower alpha letters. Again, we're not saying that in an offensive environment, you know, adversarially, you'd be aware of all this. You, of course, wouldn't. But we're teaching you how to conduct a mask attack so that when you do have known elements, you can use some of these skills to reduce your key space and hopefully increase your chances of cracking that hash. Thanks very much, everyone. I hope to see you in the next video.